Hello, can everyone hear me? Good afternoon and welcome to the Rosenbach's virtual presentation of 20th Century Lesbian and Gay Lives. You'll see on your screen our subjects for today. On the eve of Pride Month, we'll be taking a virtual sneak peek into the Rosenbach's collections of lesbian and gay material. The letters, photographs, and artwork we'll be looking at are part of a behind the bookcase tour that we normally offer when we're open. When we open back up, I invite you to participate in that tour so I can meet you all. But for now, my virtual background is a shelf from Abraham Rosenbach's personal library, and we can imagine ourselves at the Rosenbach. I'd love for today to be a conversation about what we're looking at. So if you have a question or comment, please feel free to write it in the chat window and I'll share it with everyone. I'll be asking some questions of you along the way. So if you'd like to use the chat function to respond, you certainly may. Or if you would like to just listen and look quietly, you can do that too. The Rosenbach lives in two townhomes side by side on Delancey Place. The Rosenbach brothers were dealers and collectors in rare books and manuscript, art, and fine furniture. Abraham Rosenbach was the preeminent book dealer of his day. At the very end of their lives in the early 1950s, Abraham and Philip set up the Rosenbach Foundation so that their home and collections could be shared with the public. When we can be open, we offer tours, you may come for a lecture, a class, or even a biblio cocktail party. We're so glad you're here with us now to continue the conversation online. While the Rosenbach is closed, we're pleased to bring you free virtual programming. Even though this program is free, the work that we do is not, and it would mean very much if you gave a donation. The five people we'll be spending time with today are Mercedes Diacosta, Marlena Dietrich, Jean Cocteau, Alan Leroy Locke, and Langston Hughes. They all lived the better part of their lives in the 20th century, and with the exception of Jean Cocteau, all are American. To give you some background on the situation for lesbian and gay Americans in the 20th century, here's some information on state policy around sexual difference during the lifespans of our subjects today. Acosta, Dietrich, Locke, and Hughes are such bright and accomplished personalities I want to be sure we can see them against the shadow of their time when their full selves were not accepted. For Acosta and Dietrich as women and Locke and Hughes as black men, there were additional layers of burden and limitation on them as there would be today. In that time of state-sponsored discrimination and violence against LGBTQ people, a queer person could be imprisoned, labeled a communist, have their career destroyed. People faced extreme violence at the hands of the state. By the 1950s, medical and psychological treatments to quote, cure homosexuality included electroshock, hormonal treatment, ice pick lobotomies, and chemical castration. Just to give you an example of how deep the homophobic of our culture was at that time, in early 1945, when the Allies liberated hundreds of thousands of concentration camp prisoners, the Allied military government did not repeal the provision of the Germanal Criminal Code that criminalized homosexuality. Under the Allied occupation, some gay people were forced to serve out their terms of imprisonment, regardless of time spent in concentration camps. If you're interested in reading up more on post-Holocaust re-imprisonment and violent anti-gay quote cure stateside, the websites for the American Holocaust Museum and the American Psychological Association will have more details. But I'm here to talk about some wonderful objects at the Rosenbach, and I need to introduce the people who created them or collected them first. Mercedes Diacosta is the first person we'll meet today. She was born in 1893 to a wealthy Cuban Spanish immigrant family in New York. She wrote in her autobiography that as a child, she believed herself to be a boy. She told the nuns at her school, 
I am not a boy and I am not a girl, or maybe I am both, I don't know. She grew up to become a feminist activist and writer. In the 19 teens and 1920s, she published three books of poetry, two novels, and had plays produced. In 1927, her play Jacob Slovak got good reviews for productions in New York and London with top actors. And there you see on your screen, a book of her poetry, a novel, Until the Daybreak, one of her plays, and also her late autobiography. After Jacob Slovak and other play productions, she falls into the category that we see a lot at that time of the disappearing woman playwright. Githa Sowerby and Angelica Weld Grimke are contemporary parallels to this, and only now are they getting productions again. So I'm hoping the same career reemergence will happen belatedly for Mercedes de Acosta. In 1959, Acosta sold her Letters to the Rosenbach, and they come out for love letters and 20th century lesbian and gay behind the bookcase tours. She cut quite a figure with jet black hair, white makeup, and these great shoes, which are now a part of the Rosenbach collection. The portrait is a watercolor by a friend done on the back of hotel stationery. The photographer and Cecil Beaton was Acosta's friend, and a remark in his diary gives the title to Acosta's biography by Robert A. Shank, That Furious Lesbian. People wonder why I was going about with that furious lesbian. After she died, Cecil Beaton paid her this compliment. She was one of the most rebellious and brazen of lesbians. Brazen for her time. In her autobiography, Here Lies the Heart, Acosta never quite comes out and says that the women she were involved with were more than friends. Nevertheless, she lost some dear friendships over the autobiography. One former lover who thought Here Lies the Heart was just fine and liked it very much was Marlene Dietrich, the German-American singer and actor who is remembered, among other things, as one of the first and most dedicated USO performers and war bond fundraisers in World War II. To this day, Dietrich's grave is defaced by neo-Nazis. The photo you're seeing now, and dozens like it, came with Acosta's papers. This one was taken in 1933 in Paris and says, for Mercedes, on the back. Acosta was an advocate for women being able to wear less restrictive clothing, and in Here Lies the Heart, she takes the credit for getting Dietrich to wear trousers. After the relationship began in 1932, Dietrich traveled to France, where this was taken, and it was actually illegal for a woman to wear pants unless, quote, holding a bicycle handlebar or the reins of a horse. Dietrich was warned when she got off the train in Paris, the chief of police was there to meet her. She took his arm and walked him off the platform. So I'm wondering if this photograph was taken in a moment of triumph to send to her friend back home. Acosta kept many photos and souvenirs of her former lovers, now all at the Rosenbach. And it gets me thinking about someone who had this extraordinary romantic life but despite her boldness, had limitations on what she could express in public and could never celebrate her love in public like a straight person. The photo on the left tells the story of the creation and stewardship of Marlene Dietrich's image. The director, Joseph von Sternberg, hit on this way of lighting her that she believed, and he believed, brought out the Dietrich persona. Dietrich insisted every film director she worked with after von Sternberg light her in this way. There she's in a feather boa from 1932's Shanghai Express, right around the time she met Acosta. The pictures on the right are one picture of Dietrich taken by Acosta on the steps and a framed juxtaposition of Dietrich glamour photos and some candids taken by Acosta. It's typical of the collages Acosta would make of her former lover's pictures. So I have some questions for you. What is your response to Acosta's archiving all her past romances? How do people hold on to their love affairs today? Have you done this? If so, why? So I'll look for your responses in the chat.
So I see some responses, and that says it's not always healthy to hang on to memories, indeed. Sarah says, today, people might hold on to past relationships with saved emails, instant messages, or texts, as well as digital or physical photos. And S says, I can understand that love was important to the Acosta. I, too, preserve old photos and items from relationships. Marlena was very important to her and cared about her very much. So imagine that is why she kept them. Great points. All very true. So a lot of responses are coming in. A lot of people are saying yes. <laughs> yes, they do save things. Kate says, I saw the collage of her Bible with collages of Garbo in it, and it was incredible. What a use for her Bible. I think it was in the New York Historical Society. I'd love to see that. So let's move on. Thank you so much for your responses. The next person we'll be seeing is Jean Cocteau. He was a novelist, designer, poet, artist, and filmmaker, and a friend of Marlena Dietrich. He was a fellow traveler with the Surrealists, but even the Surrealists were homophobic and kept Cocteau at arm's distance. After a lover died, Cocteau struggled with an addiction to opium. When he recovered from his addiction, he made the film Beauty and the Beast, La Belle and La Bette, which is what he's best remembered for today. Its imagery continues to inspire other artists and filmmakers. Cocteau was so nervous during the premiere of Beauty and the Beast that his friend Marlena Dietrich had to hold his hand throughout the entire screening. I'd like to give us a chance today to really look at some Cocteau prints and a Cocteau artwork in the Rosenbach collection. That's in the bottom right of your screen. Without giving you necessarily the background on these images, I'm curious about what you see in them and what you feel Cocteau is communicating with these images. And I'll give you a moment to take a look at them and write your responses in the chat. Kate says she sees a queer person longing to be able to externally realize their true self. TD says feeling incomplete kept from completeness in some way. And I'll just give it another moment in case anyone else has some thoughts on these fascinating artworks, and then we'll talk a little bit about them. So what we're seeing are some illustrations from Jean Cocteau's book, The Livre Blanc, or it translates as The White Paper. He wrote this when he was a young man, and the Rosenbach acquired this limited edition in the 1960s. The Livre Blanc is Cocteau's personal testament of his sexuality and is filled with these beautiful drawings, originally published in 1928, as I said. Although Cocteau never held, hid his sexuality, 
originally he did not allow the book to have his name printed on it. In these drawings, you can see the mixture of the ethereal and the erotic, the surreal and the classical. Cocteau actually knew a young gay sailor with the words pas de chance or no luck tattooed on his chest. And on the bottom right of the screen that I'm sharing is the original Cocteau artwork that came with the book. And I'm seeing another response. The one with the window looks like he's longing to be outside, free from whatever room that is. And that's from TD, I agree. Cocteau said that a poet doesn't draw. He just untangles his handwriting and then winds it into a picture, which I think is a really good expression of how these drawings feel. So also in France, we'll move on to Alan Leroy Locke. This great portrait of him is by the German artist, Weinold Rice. Born in Philadelphia, Locke studied at Howard, Harvard, and Oxford, and was the first African-American Rhodes Scholar. He studied philosophy and was a professor of philosophy for 41 years at Howard University. He was also a writer and critic and saw his role as a helpful sage and advisor to black literature. Locke's 1925 anthology, The New Negro, broke ground for a generation of African-American writers then coming into distinction, including Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, and Langston Hughes. He's often called the Dean of the Harlem Renaissance, sometimes the father or the godfather of the Harlem Renaissance, but philosophical midwife is how Locke described his role himself. Just to give you a little more background on Locke and his significance, Martin Luther King, in a 1968 speech, placed Locke beside William E.B. Du Bois as an example of a black philosopher he foresaw young people one day learning about alongside Plato and Aristotle. One of the writers Locke helped was Rene Moran, a black Guyanese writer whose novel Batuala was the first by a black person to win France's most respected literary prize, their Pulitzer, the Prix de Goncourt. This was in 1921. In 1929, Locke offered Moran's Batuala manuscript for $250 to the Rosenbach Company, quote, subject to Rene Moran's cable confirmation. In this letter, you see Locke being Locke. You see him advocating for a black writer. The Rosenbach Company bought the manuscript, and early Rosenbach curators added first editions and early editions of Batuala to the collection. As a native Philadelphian and a great Black and queer figure, Locke got a mural recently in Philadelphia's neighborhood. Like Acosta, Locke was known to be gay, but could not fully be out. And like Acosta, he kept souvenirs of his male lovers. Two autobiographical notes in Locke's archive describe his attitude toward his sexuality. In 1948, he wrote, casting himself as a gay Achilles, quote, my wise and loving mother dipped me as a very young child in the magic waters of cold cynicism and haughty distrust and disdain of public opinion. However, the all too vulnerable slash invulnerable Achilles heel of homosexuality I kept in an armored shell reserve and haughty caution. In 1949, Locke wrote of himself as, quote, three minorities. Had I been born in ancient Greece, I would have escaped the first, homophobia. In Europe, I would have been spared the second, racism. In Japan, I would have been above rather than below average in height. One of the writers Locke encouraged and also pursued as a love interest was Langston Hughes. Mainly known as a poet, whose work continues to resonate with readers, Hughes also wrote novels, short stories, essays, and plays. He wrote about working class black lives with realism. He described his poetry as being about workers, roustabouts, and singers, and job hunters, quote, people up today and down tomorrow, working this week and fired the next, beaten and baffled, but determined not to be wholly beaten. Many white critics just ignored just ignored him, and black critics were frustrated by him for lacking an assimilationist aim. He wanted to take life as a subject just as it was. In his essay, The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain, Hughes wrote, we younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark-skinned selves without fear or shame. 
If white people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, it doesn't matter. Langston Hughes was a friend to Marianne Moore, whose parlor was reassembled at the Rosenbach. She's the great 20th century modernist American poet. Among Moore's papers, we have great Christmas cards Langston Hughes sent her, the program from her viewing of Hughes's play, Black Nativity, and notes for an introduction she did for one of his lectures. You can see that they were friends, and there they are, enjoying a cup of tea together. This is one of Langston Hughes's Christmas notes to Moore, thanking her for a book she sent him and sending her an anthology she had edited, or he had edited. You can see it here on a shelf of Moore's books, The Best Short Stories by Negro Writers, 1966. And there is his inscription to her, Happy Holidays to Mary Ann, from one Missourian to another, Langston. Langston Hughes continues to be a touchstone for black gay male identity. Isaac Julian's film, Looking for Langston, is both a memorial to Hughes and a meditation on black gay identity in the Harlem Renaissance. In Spike Lee's film, Get on the Bus, a gay man traveling to the Million Man March in DC punches out a homophobe and says, that's for James Baldwin and Langston Hughes. I wanted to take a look with you at two poems by two of the writers on this tour. That's Acosta's poem, Soiled Hands, side by side with Hughes's poem, Vice Squad, 3 a.m. These poems come from the world we saw in that early slide of 20th century repressive laws and lack of protections where being out or being discovered could get you fired, discharged, ostracized, arrested. I'll give you a moment to read them and think on them. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. I have a few questions for you. And after you've had a chance to read the poems, we'll move ahead and I'll ask you some questions. But feel free to include your thoughts right now as you're reading the poems. So the questions that I had for you are what similarities did you see in mood, tone, and setting? And what do you see in them? What do they reveal to you? And also what differences do you see in point of view between the poems? And what do they reveal to you? And I'll look for your responses in the chat. That brings us to the end of our presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for participating. I'm so grateful you've chosen to spend part of your afternoon with us at the Rosenbach when we reopen. Please do come in person, take a tour with one of our wonderful guides, take in an exhibit, or sign up for behind the bookcase to see and handle objects like we've seen today and more. 
please do consider a donation in any amount or a membership at the Mary Shelley, Abigail Adams, Phyllis Wheatley, Miguel de Cervantes, or Charlotte Bronte levels. When you give, it proves to the Rosenbach that we should be doing this kind of queer program. And one last thing. Today is the final day to bid on auction items for our annual Rosenbach and Al fundraiser, including a private LGBT collections tour with me that will go deeper into queer history farther back into the past, including a significant artifact of transgender history dating back to the 18th century. You can bid at rosenbach.org, Rosenbach and Al 2020. And I'll leave you with this image from the Rosenbach collection of Marlena Dietrich and Amelia Earhart when Amelia Earhart stopped by the Song of Songs set because you needed this for some humor before we all return to the world such as it is. Taken the same day as this, there's another photo that is even more awkward and weird with the director of the film, Robert Mamoulian, in a suit wedged into bed awkwardly beside Marlena Dietrich. It's great. I'll end with some questions and stay, along, stay around for as long as you would all like to talk. I would love to know which of these artists and authors interest you and who here you would like to learn more about. Oh, sorry. Oh, here we go. And I'm also curious, why do you think it's important to understand LGBTQ history in our time? And I'll leave you with those questions. Thanks so much for spending your afternoon with us at the Rosenbach. We have some thoughts coming in on the Langston Hughes and Mercedes de Acosta poems. Alice says, Acosta's is more whimsical. Hughes's searches for support and works more from fear-based living. Indeed. And I wonder if Hughes, as a black man, writes from the third person point of view, or as Acosta is a little bit more confident writing from her own point of view in this time. So if you have any thoughts whatsoever about anything we saw today, I'll stick around and we can keep the chat going. S says, I'm interested in learning about Marlena and Mercedes. That collection intrigues me personally, and I hope to see more of it, the photos, artifacts, et cetera, someday. And I would love to show you those things. For now, there's an article up on the Rosen blog specifically about Marlena Dietrich in reference to what we have of her in the Mercedes de Acosta collection. So that might hold you over, but definitely when we open up again, come visit us. Rachel King says, since LGBTQ people were not allowed to live freely and publicly in the past, the archival record is especially important. Those kinds of personal records reveal a previously hidden history. Indeed, and we're so grateful that Mercedes de Acosta kept such good records and mementos of her relationships because otherwise, queer lives can disappear. Oh, and Kate is giving a shout out to Larry Kramer. Yeah, we'll give a shout out to St. Larry. Rest in peace, sir. So if there are no more comments, I'll share my email. And if something comes to your mind later on, please do email me at the Rosenbach. It's my name, A. White, 
short for Andrew White. So a white at Rosenbach.org. And I'd love to continue the conversation. Thanks so much for joining us today.